Hello, this is Jeff Hyman, and welcome to the Recruit Rockstars podcast. Every Tuesday and Thursday, I interview a world-class expert on talent and recruiting and scaling businesses so that you can do the same. And I am thrilled with today's guest. I'm a little humbled, a little bit nervous. I'm a customer. I'm a long-term fan of Russell Brunson. Let me tell you briefly about Russell because the story is as remarkable as it gets when you think about objectively scaling a business. And I'll just give you the facts, and I think you'll come away as impressed as I have been. Russell is the co-founder of ClickFunnels, which is one of the world's fastest growing non-VC-backed companies. So don't believe what you hear that you need to raise a ton of venture capital or private equity to scale a business successfully. He has built this company over the past six years, along with some co-founders, and it is now at roughly privately held companies. So we don't know exactly, but based on my calculations, probably about 100 million revenue per year. And I've done at least a couple hundred million revenue since inception. Again, guys, no venture capital funding. And if that wasn't enough, he's a college wrestling champion, comes out of college, invents this potato gun, has to figure out how to market it and uh, invents click funnels, which are basically marketing funnels made easy online. What we're gonna talk about over the next 20 minutes is how he's scaled the business, how he has scaled the team. He's got almost 400 people. He didn't learn how to do that in high school, so he, or as a wrestling champion, so he's going to take us through a bit of that education. So with all that said, Russell, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Likewise. I really appreciate it. So I gave a brief overview of ClickFunnels, but maybe just give me the 60 seconds for, the, for customers or for listeners that are not customers uh, about yeah. what ClickFunnels was and how it was uh, born. Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing is, um, you know, for me and uh, my, my co-founders, like we are obsessed with helping entrepreneurs. Like it's every good thing in my life came because an entrepreneur risked everything to try to create something. Um, and uh, everything from my, my twins being born to a million other things came because an entrepreneur risked uh, something. And so we've been passionate about helping and serving them. And for years I was teach like I was doing events and seminars trying to teach entrepreneurs how to get their message out to the world. And we kept talking about this concept of funnels that we were using but we were like hand coding everything and people would conceptually understand it and they try to do it and it never really worked. And uh, about six years ago, my co-founder, who's a genius, he, um, he coded the first version of ClickFunnels uh, to make it simple for me and for everybody else to use. And we launched that about five years ago and it is, it's been, it's been a crazy ride. I'm not going to lie from zero to 115,000 active customers. And um, you know, every, as you know, every tier of scaling comes with uh, new opportunities and new, new challenges. And so we've had a ton of fun learning and growing and it's been a, it's been a wild ride for sure. I want to talk about some of those tiers going from one person or two or three to 10 to 20. We'll get to that. But um, you know, one thing you said, which, resonates with me is it's not about what you do. It's first figuring out who you want to serve mm -hmm. in both the business sense and the worldly sense. And you're incredibly generous with your time for so many people. Um, why is that important? I think that so many entrepreneurs and founders miss that. They kind of think about the money first, the golden ring or the exit or the IPO. And then they kind of figure about what are we going to do? <laughs> how did you kind of, how had that click with you? Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's interesting. I think, um, you know, I was lucky enough that when I first got started in this business 15 years ago or so, when I first started, um, I was like most business owners, most entrepreneurs, you start something and you're chasing the money. And, uh, and luckily, you know, for me, money came pretty quick at first. And really quickly, I was like, huh, that was not what I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be like, you know, the movies and you get the money, you're like, wow, that was like really unfulfilling. But I like, I enjoyed the, the creation process of like creating these things. And, and, um, and the next phase for me, as like, I started falling in love with my customers. Like I really, um, you know, me making a million bucks was like, that was cool. But then like I'd help somebody and I watched them do it and I watched yeah. them have light bulb moments in their head and those things. And like, that became so much more fulfilling for me. So, um, plus that's you knew, I, you must've known if you could help them do that, the money would follow. Yeah. It, oh, hundred percent. Yeah. And, and it, it obviously it, it does, but it shifts your focus. And I think in, in a really good way, cause when you're chasing the money, your mind does, I don't know, you make dumb decisions. You're, you're, you're doing decisions based on, on the thing that seems the, the thing that's going to make you the most money versus like, how, like what's going to actually serve this person the most. So when you shift the mindset to that, then the right things come to you. Yep. Um, yep. And I think it's, it's like a little intricacy that I'm sure some people think, Oh, it's woo woo or it's weird or whatever, but, but it, it means everything. Like I can't tell you how many of our conversations as a, as a management team are just like, okay, how do we make this simpler for our customer? How do we, how do we serve them? Like, what are they looking for next? Like, what's the, and the more we ask those questions, the yeah. more the right ideas come up. 
every time we've had a question that's like, how do we increase sales? How do we increase our ARPU? How do we like, those questions always backfire when we do something stupid that doesn't actually help the community. You know, it's, it's just shifting the, the question. And it, uh, when you do that, the, the right answers come. You're not focused on the competition. You're not focused on making investors happy. You're focused on the one thing that matters. So let's talk about now the people part of all this, because you've talked to death and people have been watching interviews, podcasts with you about how you've built this amazing product. And I'm a customer. Um, let's talk about scaling the business. You went from what, two, three co-founders to 400 people, right? Over <laughs> what, six years you said? Uh, yeah, about almost six years now. Yeah. Got it. And as you alluded to Russell, the, the business morphs, right? When you go to 10 people, then 25, then 50, then hundred, now 400. Mm -hmm. What's the most painful thing that you learned along the way of doing that? about how you reinvent or recreate the organization and the business and the culture along that way to enable that kind of scaling. Yeah, it's, and, and I wish, I wish that like I had read a book in college that would have helped because we, because so much of it was like, it was like waking up in the morning, getting hit in the face, like, Oh, yeah. how do we solve this problem? You know, and like, <laughs> you know, I don't have time to read a book. Like we got to solve it right now. And, and it's funny because the, the first thing is like, we didn't know if we were have a product that, that worked. So it was me and Todd Dickerson, me, we were the two co-founders initially. And he was the coder. I was the guy who had to sell it. And we had yeah. one other partner who came in named Dylan, who was also um, a, co uh, a coder as well. So they were building the product. I was trying to figure out how to sell it. And we got it done. We started selling it. And the first thing, it didn't sell. And then I was like, okay, there's the first problem. No one's buying it. So that was like, that was on me. So I had to keep figuring out different ways. And eventually, um, you know, I was able to, to try different things. And so eventually I figured out the right message that, that spoke right. They got people to, to buy. So that was like the first thing. And then we were just like, yeah, it's gonna be amazing. And then it's kind of like, I don't know if you ever saw the old UPS or FedEx commercial where like they, the, the company surrounded in a little thing and they're looking at the computer and they get the first sale. They're like, yeah. And then second yeah. sale. Like, yeah, and then it, it starts, it starts like, going and going and going. Like, yeah. Uh -oh. <laughs> like, that's kind of what happened. And I remember yeah. when Todd, when we first launched it, Todd told me, he's like, he's like, ClickFunnels should be really stable to about 10,000 members. And I was like, yeah. I don't know what that means, but let's go, you know? And so we start selling it. And in less than a year, we, we got to 10,000 members. And all of a sudden these things start happening. We're like, there were glitches. With the, with the technology platform? Yeah. Just didn't, yeah. It, it wasn't built for scale, right? Yeah, like well, we thought 10,000 people was scale. So for us, we're like, we got 10,000, that'd be amazing. <laughs> right. Uh, and so we got to 10,000, you know, we'd get into 10,000 and it just glitched and we'd go down for 30 minutes here and there and stuff. And, and I didn't know what to do and Todd didn't know what to do. And it was just, you know, he's like, I told you 10,000, we're going to need something else. And we didn't know it was above like our ability to know what to do, you know? So then we started looking like, okay, we have to learn the skill. We got to find the right, the right talent. Um, and so we started reaching out actually to a recruiting firm who found a, a Ruby developer for us um, who we, who we brought in and who, who now is one of our, one of our partners. He was like the right person to bring in. He had mm -hmm. experienced the more of a corporate, like Todd and I are both, you know, we're, we're marketing entrepreneur hackers who just yeah. create stuff. And, and we needed someone to come in who actually had, had been on an enterprise level software and understood the scale understand, understand how, to, how it scales and how you build it to be bulletproof and redundant and all those things. Yeah. And Got so it. he came in and, and it, it just the right person. It was such a big thing. Cause we, you know, Todd would code something, push it live all the time. And like, you would go live and it would like, this thing would break and they fix that and then push it live. And <laughs> didn't know anything about code, like, like yeah. tests, like running tests around every single line of code and all sorts of stuff like that. And so Ryan came in and was like, Oh my gosh, like, <laughs> like, what did you guys do? Or like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> he came in, like, hey, well, we, this is the things we need to do. So he built out this team now of like, okay, we need, guys to come in and like write codes or everything. So when we push a line of code, we can see what happens in the whole software, right? We need a testing environment. We can test it first before it goes to production and like setting up all the infrastructure stuff that we didn't have. And while those things, it's funny because those things were so necessary for us to get from 10,000 to the next tier. But if we would have had those things in place, we never would have got to 10,000 members. Like that, that part took that? us- How do you know that? Because it took us two years just to get those things in place. If we would have had oh, those I things see. in place, we never would have come to market. We would have been so it goes, it goes back to the, the infamous VC who talks about building things not to scale, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm blank on his name right now, but he basically has this famous article, which is don't build to scale, build to just get to proof of concept and de-risk the concept as early as you can, and then go back and fix it later to scale. 100%. I'm a big believer in that because I don't think we ever would have got there um, had we have had done it that way. And yeah. so, and so that was kind of the big thing is getting the software stable and platforms. So and that started working and we're like, okay, now we're stable. Now we have a team and it wasn't just Todd. I mean, I feel so bad for Todd. Like it'd be Christmas day at three in the morning and he's like, he's doing coding. Something. I'm, like, I'm so sorry. I wish I knew how to, I wish I had some skills. I could help you. I got nothing. Yeah. Um, 
who gave it, take the pressure off his back when I was like, I have a team, there's people, it's not just 100% his vision, he can now share the vision and there's a team of people. And, and that was kind of the, on, on the, the, mar, the, the, the product side of the company where that started growing. And now, you know, we've been able to grow multiple tiers now with a lot of managers and, you know, and now there's a, 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 good, a good team there that's, that's doing all that stuff. And so that was like that side of the company. And then, you know, my side's more like the marketing and the sales. And so then I started coming the same thing as, as we're trying to grow. And now we're hitting bottlenecks of like, we're stagnant. Like we can't get more member, you know, we're, we're getting members that we're stuck or our churn's too high or like, yep, yep. and it was the same kind of thing where like, I have my, my bag of tricks and the things I'm really, really good at, but I don't know how to decrease. I can sell stuff. I can't decrease churn. Like I don't, my sure. brain can't think through that, you know? And so it's, sure. it's coming out and, and kind of finding the, the right people for those things. And it's, um, I, I'm, I'm a big superhero nerd fan. So I, I always talk about team. I, I was like, I, I told him, I'm like, this, this is the phase that we're in. Like right now, like Todd's Iron Man, cause he's the genius billionaire. Like I can be Thor or something, but like, if, if we're going to take over the world, we need, we need like the entire Avengers team. Like we need, you know, we need a Hulk. We need a, you know, we need all these different people. And so that's when we start, start sitting back and it wasn't so much like, we didn't even think through like org charts or things like that. It was just like, who are the rock stars we need? I remember Todd had read something uh, um, somewhere. It was like, it was like uh, one, like an A player versus a B player. And like one A player is worth like 3,200 times more than a B player. Something yeah, like sure. that. Yep. So we're and like, Steve okay, Jobs said the same thing. He, he yeah. said uh, he'd rather have a team of five developers than 500 uh, B players. 100%. So that was our thoughts. Like, okay, we need to find not like someone who's good, but like the best person yeah. for these four or five roles because we can't, I, I don't have the skill set. I, I don't want to, I don't yeah. want to learn it. I don't have the time to learn it. We need to find the right people for all these different things. And so that became like, we got to build our Avengers team. We need to go find, <laughs> find our whole. And you were doing that in Boise at the time. This was before you went outside Boise, right? Kind of. Well, so Todd, Todd, my co-founder lives in Atlanta. Um, so we were already kind of separated anyway. I, I was, it was funny. I was trying to get him to move to Boise. And it was the same time that, um, that base camp came out with their book remote and he yeah. read remote. He's like, I don't have to move to Boise now. I'm like, no. <laughs> so from day one though, we were kind of remote. So like he was yeah. in Atlanta, I was in Boise. And yeah. then, so it's uh, in the DNA of the company. Everything, yeah. Everything kind of started that way. And so, um, and we figured, you know, if base camp 37 signals, if they could build a remote team, you know, they we were looking at them like with the, you know, ClickFunnels was built on Ruby on Rails, which is the platform they developed. Like yeah. so many of the methodologies we learned from them. So we're like, look, if they're going to do that, it means it's possible. So we can kind of model that as well as we were doing our thing. Yeah. And so it was nice because it was hard to recruit super good talent in Boise. And, uh, and we realized that. So it's like, okay, instead of trying to find the best person in Boise, who's the best person, we give them the opportunity to work from home, to work in a, yeah. in a cool company. And, and uh, what's been cool about that is we're able to attract talent that we couldn't have otherwise, right? It opens so up the world of talent, right? Yeah, like our uh, Ryan, who's the the guy that came in, you know, the that was our CTO for a long time that built out that structure. Like he was the guy who, if he would have moved to San Francisco, be making eight hundred thousand yeah, dollars a year or sure. more. But he's like, I want to live in Michigan at my house, sure. and we're like, okay, well, we can pay you one fifty for that, two fifty, yep. whatever it was. Yep. You know, he's like, yep. all right, done. It's you know? a huge difference, right? Um, you mentioned Russell. You mentioned a term, rock star, across all these roles, whether they're developers, customer support, and I'm blown away by your customer support. I mean, you get responses in like a couple minutes. It's crazy. What is the common theme of ClickFunnels? If I were to dissect the DNA of the company, and so much of you is in that, uh, what is that common theme? If you had to put it into words so that you could hire that 401st person, it can't just be a magical thing, right? What is it? So uh, it's probably not true for 100%. Like I would say the development team is probably a little different than like the side that I'm sure, kind of more sure. involved with, just, yep. you know, products or, um, but from like the, from the, the side that I'm, I'm more, uh, involved with, you know, we, I told you before, we're passionate about entrepreneurs and, um, and I, I would say the people that work for us, they may not be the entrepreneur who's like out there starting their own business, but they're people who would, right. But they're, uh, we call them entrepreneurs. Like they're, they're inside the company, but like they look at this, like they, most of our hires are people who are customers first, the people who are customers who are trying to grow a company. They haven't figured out for whatever reason, but they love us. They love the mission. They come to the events. They, they wear the t-shirts like they're, they're doing all this stuff anyway. Yeah. And they're like, wait, they're I can, followers, I can, right? Yeah. And like, I can yeah. work for click funnels while I'm trying to get my, my thing figured out. And so, so many, I, I would say probably 80% of our, our team are people who are customers first. Who, who understand the vision, the mission, they're passionate. Yeah. Like they're, they're geeking out on this. Like they're listening to my podcast while they're answering support questions. And like, it's so cool to have a company who they're excited by what we're doing too. It's not just like, oh, we hired some dude who's, who's clicking the buttons. It's like, you know, they're paycheck, right. right. So I think, you know, there, there's so much, I think that, um, like that, that helps, like that's more powerful than talent in so many, in so many cases. 
you know what I mean? Where, where they're, they love what they're doing. So they're willing to work hard. They're willing to figure it out their, they love the customers as much as we do. So it makes a, a better experience uh, all around. Listen, don't, don't you ever get concerned though, that in hiring entrepreneurial types that they're going to leave and you're going to have a churn issue because entrepreneurs are, are usually pretty bad employees. And I would assume you'd be a pretty bad employee, Russell, at most places. Um, <laughs> don't you ever worry about that? And that you'd spend a lot of time to kind of spin your wheels? Um, I don't. And, and the reason why is because, again, my, my mission, like the company's mission is to help entrepreneurs. And so if the way I'm helping entrepreneurs, I give them a job while they're figuring this stuff out and they go on their own and they change the world. Yeah, yeah. 100% okay with that. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I think I, uh, I, I have uh, employees who get mad about this. We're like, we'll have a competitor come out. Someone creates a feature and I'm like, yeah. and, and someone, someone will stop using part of our software because of this new thing. And they're like so offended. I'm like, who cares? Like, like our goal is not for someone to use click funnels. Our yeah. goal is for entrepreneurs to grow their company. Like that's, right. that's the right. mission. If they, if they can do that better here or somewhere else, like I'm okay with that. Like it doesn't, like I, I just want, like, I honestly love entrepreneurs so much. And I believe that them doing the thing is, is why we're here. I don't yeah. care how, like what platform they, I hope they use mine. I'm going to try to do our best to make it the best possible, but I just want them to do the thing. I've seen what an entrepreneur can do if they can get their message out. And so that's more important to me. So like if someone's coming in our fold and they have a chance to work for us and they're helping and they're serving. And then in that, in that time, they're learning things and they go and, and start their own thing. And now they affect, you know, this huge ripple effect because the people's lives they can change. Yeah. I'm, I'm, in fact, my, my lead funnel builder for two years, uh, he left me and he started this whole company now and he's killing it. He's got tons of people he's serving and like I am as happy as can be for him. So you take a, you take a very karma type of approach to the world, right? You, you again, think about who you want to serve mm -hmm. and then you figure out exactly how that's going to happen. And if your paths cross again, I'm sure some people leave and come back, I would guess. You probably have a lot of boomerang sure. hires, right? Yeah. Um, how, let's talk a little about, before we wrap up, you and your role and how it's morphed and the senior leadership team, you're leading a 400 person company. I have to imagine you spend your days doing things very differently than when you first started. Some of those things good, maybe some pretty boring, but tell us a bit about how you made that personal transition from potato gun inventor and salesperson to starting <laughs> ClickFunnels to now leading a 400 person company. Yeah, you, You've obviously grown along the way, but how, how do you spend your days now? Yeah. So one of the big ahas I had in this journey, uh, probably about two years ago was, um, cause I was hiring a team and I was like frustrated cause they weren't doing what I wanted to do all the time. And you know, I still get some of that frustration sometime, but, um, I realized that my whole life I'd been like the all-star, right? Like I was the guy who had the idea and I created the funnel. And I did the copy and I did the thing and I launched it. And like, and like when, when it worked, like I was the guy who got my hand raised and I was like, yeah, I won. And it was I the Russell show, right? Yes. I love that feeling. Right. Yeah. And so I was doing that and doing that. And I'm trying to like, now I'm trying to like, pull myself out to grow. So I'd hire a team and have them do stuff. And then it was like, they do something. And then I would, I was equivalent of imagine like playing basketball with Michael Jordan and you're on his team and you're about to take yeah. a shot. And he's like, I knew better grabs the ball and like shoots and like, yeah, I scored again. Yeah. And I was really, that's what I was doing to my team. Like I was the guy coming and stealing the ball from my own teammate and dunking it so I could get my hand raised. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I realized like, Oh my gosh, like for me to be successful, I have to learn, I have to transition from being, from being an all-star to a coach. And, 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 it's funny because at the same time I was going through the same transition in my personal life where I was a wrestler my whole life. My kids are yeah. now at the age where they're starting to wrestle and I'd be, I was coaching my kids at night wrestling and it was so hard for me because I'm like, ah, oh, I want to go on the mat and just do it. And I was like, I have to learn how to coach them. And at first it's, it's a hard transition for anyone yeah. who's ever had made that transition because you're like, because they don't do it the way you would do it exactly. And you got to watch them fail and struggle. It's so, it's so hard. But then what's interesting is uh, I actually had called my dad about this and I was like talking to my dad, how frustrated and my dad was a great wrestler as well. And he was my coach for a decade. And he told me afterwards, he's like, you know what, looking back on my life, he's like, the most fulfilling decade of my life was not the decade I was an athlete. It was the decade I was a coach. Wow. And I was like, it's pretty heavy Gosh. because yeah. of the influence so like, you I, can make on so many more people. Yeah. And so for me, I was like, okay, I have to, and again, I struggle I, to this day. So you can ask my team, like I, everyone's I'm like, ah, oh, like, but I'm, I'm trying, I'm getting better at it, but it's that transition from all-star to coach that gives you the ability to step back and, and have a team and doing things. And so and it's looking at yourself, you know, like, like Jordan can, he can dunk, he can pass, he can do it. He can dribble, he can do everything. It's like, Hey, but if we're going to build an, a team and I'm an Avenger team, I need a point guard. I need like, you know, I need all the things so for me. It's like, I can build a funnel. I can write copy. I can do just like, I can do these things, but instead of me being like a, a seven out of 10 designer, I need a yeah. 10 out of 10 designer who's yeah. the best in the yeah. world, you yeah. know, and, and each piece, like the best in the world. And, uh, and that's kind of what we've been doing on, on our side. And uh, again, it's, it's, it's not perfect. I, I won't, I won't stretch and say it is, but it's, it's been the transition I've had to 
learn it that's um that's making most of the growth possible to this day and it has it been the hardest part for you personally the hardest yeah. transition definitely yeah. it, it makes it's marketing look like nothing, it's been right? it's been it's been really like now that we're seeing excuse me, seeing the fruits of it, it's been really rewarding. Cause we, yeah. you know, inside of our company, we give away, uh, when someone in our, in our, uh, in our company, when makes a million dollars in a funnel, we give them a two comma club award and things like that. And so what we've been doing now is for our team, when they launch a funnel for us, it's two comma club. Like we give them all their own, their own two comma club. And so it's fun. Now I do our team meetings. They all have their two comma club award on the, on the, <laughs> they're super proud. And they're like, they're looking, they're, they're now anxiously engaged in the funnel. Cause they want to get another award. And they want to show their, yeah. their family that they're, they were part of this funnel and things like that. So it's been really cool just to see, um, them more bought in as well, you know? There's a great video online that I encourage people to watch where you really document your journey through this question with Tony Robbins, thinking through, should I be the leader or should I hire someone else to take my place? And I think you've raised a good point, Russell, which is entrepreneurs need to make that decision, right? Do I want to, if you don't want to be the coach, if you want to be the all-star player, bring in the coach to lead the company and you focus on what you love doing, whether it's creating content or coding or whatever. But you've successfully scaled from two to 400 people. You've got to make that transition. One last question before we wrap up, how have you led the team virtually? So what, what is kind of the cadence of you working with your leadership team on a daily, weekly, monthly basis? What does that look like? Yeah. So one thing nice, you know, before the whole COVID thing, most of our team uh, has, has been, was remote. Of our 400 plus employees, I'd say maybe 30 to 40 of them were in offices and everyone else yep. was working from home. So that was nice. Yep. So what we do is every morning uh, at 9 a.m. Mountain Time, we have, uh, we called our Pulse meeting and it's an all hands on deck. Every company, every person in the company's on. It's a seven minute meeting um, where it's on Zoom. We all jump in. And uh, basically, we go through uh, the KPIs of each department. And it's nice because it gives, it gives vertical uh, accountability. It's every day or every week? Every day, every morning. Every day. If, yeah. I'm, if I work there, I'm hearing the key metrics across the whole business. Every morning, yep. So each department head comes in and says, okay, this is, this is what we did yesterday. So we did. So it's a really quick meeting, but it's nice because everyone can see day to day, like what's going up, what's going down. Yep. It's not me coming down. No like, place to hide. You need more leads. They're like embarrassed. Like, oh, I got less leads today than, you know, like, so everyone's kind of, there's vertical accountability, which, which takes a lot of pressure of me off of that. And so that's the seven minute meeting. And then from there, each department, not all of them, they all have a different cadence kind of depending on them. But like for the marketing side, as soon as that meeting ends, the entire marketing team jumps to another thing. And then each marketing section, the marketing department kind of goes through, um, here's what we did yesterday. Here's what's happening today. And here's any roadblocks I have. And it's really quickly, he's got like three minutes to go through that. Um, if there's roadblocks, we don't talk about on the meeting. We just like, who's the roadblock? Who do you need to connect them? And then afterwards jump on, we do that really quick. And then everyone's, you know, by nine fifteen every morning, everyone's got marching orders. We're all, we've seen the goals, we've seen the vision, uh, all the roadblocks are taken care of. And then we all just start running after that. And so that's, those are the ones that happen daily. And then, um, and then we have, you know, the, um, a partner meeting once a week with, um, with me, me, my co-founder and I, and then our, um, five, four, four, five, four, five other <laughs> uh, partners now who are, yeah. who are involved in business. And, yep. uh, it's more of a, it's less structured. It's just kind of us to talk through the things that are, that are on our minds and, and it's um, weekly that, that, that takes place weekly. Yeah. We do it once a week. Great. We try to do Great. less, but like, I, I missed it. Like it's. It's the one thing that I miss by having an office is having yeah. to sit down and talk. And it's just like, for me, it's like, it's, it helps give me fulfillment in what we're doing. Cause it's like, sure. I get to hang out with the, with the guys that I, we, we built the same. We've all gone to war together. We've yeah. killed ourselves. We put, you know, it's just, it's a fun time to hang out and then just talk about each of our departments specifically and, and uh, anything we're concerned about or stuff like that. Um, and, uh, and that's the, the core things that happen. So it's, been it's clearly built for speed. I mean, you have clearly with a daily kind of cadence like that, a lot of companies have a monthly or quarterly cadence, right? But you've also built a business where you can get the metrics every day, right? Yep. You know exactly what's happening at any point in time. Russell Brunson, I give you a ton of credit. I'm a fan. I'm a customer. Uh, I've read all three books and that is maybe the good place for listeners to start. If you haven't read one of the 500,000 books that Russell has written and sold and given away, you can get free, his free books. Uh, Russell, how do, how do people get started? How do they learn more about you and get in touch? Yeah, um, I say that if, it, if, if someone came to me and they're like, what should I do right get, rather get? The first thing I do, the first book I wrote is called Dotcom Secrets and it's the psychology of sales funnels. Like I think that's the best place for them to start because it can help you understand this whole world, like how you could use a funnel to actually grow your company. And you'll see behind the scenes of like, how did, you know, how do you spend a million dollars a month, Russell, and your advertising budget, like you, you don't spend any money. How do you do that? Like it shows you how we do that through our front end, front end funnels. I would get that book and then I go get a ClickFunnels account and there's free trial at clickfunnels.com to kind of play with it and start building out funnels. 
So that's probably the two best places to get started and kind of plug in. And uh, the book will help you understand the psychology of what we do. And then the software is the practical application of it. And uh, it'll plug you into our community and you'll, you'll get to see all the crazy funnel hackers and people who are, uh, who are obsessed with trying to figure out how they can change the world. And it's a, it's a lot of fun. And no one is more obsessed than you. And you <laughs> have made a huge impact on, on uh, hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs. I congratulate you. Russell, thank you again. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it.